This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Today's guest is an author and former Hollywood set designer. Beckett Cook grew up with a secret. He was attracted to other men and had put himself in an accepting environment in California. Today we'll find out not only how God changed his heart about Jesus, but how he is passionately pursuing what he says now is the new guy in his life and what it's cost him. In Paris one night, Beckett Cook looked out over the sea of people who were out there dancing thinking, my life really doesn't have any meaning. And I think maybe at that point in time, God had planted a seed to call you uh, to him. Uh, Beckett, yes. Beckett, I, what happened that night? I think so. Well, I, so I was in, I used to go to fashion weeks in New York and Paris all the time. And I, uh, this, I, this was March of 2009. And I had gone to a bunch of the shows and to, you know, a lot of the fashion shows, the runway shows have after parties. And I was at this after party one night at a club in the middle of Paris. And I think it was Stella McCartney's uh, party. And Kanye was there and the whole fashion world was there. And I just, I looked out over the crowd. Everyone was drinking champagne and dancing and ha and having the times of their lives. And and I was sitting with these kind of fashion TV people, uh, Rachel Zoe and her husband. They had a rea they have a reality show on TV, and um, <clears throat> and I just remember looking out and just feeling this overwhelming emptiness. And I I didn't know what was going on, and I just felt like this can't be my life anymore. Like I've done all these fabulous things in my life and I've met everyone and I've been everywhere. I, you know, live in Hollywood. I'm friends with a lot of movie stars and, but I just felt like I, this can't sustain me anymore. Like I've done this for many, many, many years and this can't, I can't go on like this. <laughs> and so I went back to my hotel and uh, I was up all night in a panic about my future. I didn't know what to do because I knew I couldn't, I knew I, God was not an option for me because I was gay. So mm -hmm. I was like, okay, well, God's not an option, but what am I gonna, who, what is the option? Like, I don't even know what to do. And that's, that was March of 2009 in Paris. And you're saying that you, you were gay and that, so God wasn't an option. So you, you're thinking that the, the, the jet set life might be meaningless, but you still hadn't been challenged on the, on the gay part of your life, the relationship part of your life, had you? No, no. Uh, I mean, I, I had been living uh, as a gay man since, I don't know, since college, really. And, um, but I mean, the same sex attraction went way back to elementary school, yeah. but it, it didn't really come, become my identity till right after college. And then, uh, and I cycled through many, many relationships in, L in Los Angeles with yeah. guys and and um, so it was still fully my identity in March of 2009. I mean, that that wasn't even an option for me at that point, even though I felt like I didn't know what my future was going to be like. Mm -hmm. I still thought that was part of my identity sure. for sure. Well, it was your uh, uh, your identity. I mean, when you first realized that same sex attraction, give us a snapshot of what uh, what that Hollywood life was like, because it was a life of validation. It was a life of, of uh, acceptance. I mean, you were, you, you were with your people. I mean, you had people that enjoyed that lifestyle and validated that lifestyle. Uh, could you ever see yourself leaving that lifestyle? No. I mean, I, when I moved to L.A. in 1993, I was immediately embraced by a whole group of fun friends mm -hmm. that were, and, and not all of them were gay. It was like right. some were gay, some were straight. But they were all just so... Uh, they were all part of the business in Hollywood, producers, actors, directors, writers, and, and that, and they, of course, welcomed me with open arms and Los Angeles, I mean, welcomed me with open arms as a gay man. There was no, there were no issues with that here. Um, and I just, uh, I thought, yeah, I mean, I was, I was happy to be in a place in a city where it wasn't a big deal to be gay and it wasn't an issue. In fact, it was kind of celebrated. So I, I, I actually in, uh, enjoyed that when I first moved here. Yeah. What you're, you're from, uh, from Texas, right? From Dallas, Texas. Yeah. yeah. In a, in a, uh, a Catholic family, a large family, your dad's yes. an attorney. Uh, they're all pretty traditional, traditional Catholic. Yes. 
Wh what do they think? Were they just glad that you moved to LA and, and weren't with them anymore? Or did they, did they <laughs> welcome you back? Or what, what, kind of, what kind of sense did you get from the family? Oh, no, they, well, my parents, I was the youngest of eight kids. So by the time they got to me, <laughs> they were very much hands off and kind of let me just do my own thing. And when I came out to my parents, they were pretty lovely about it. They weren't, mm -hmm. they didn't have some like crazy reaction to it. They just were like, <clears throat> okay, well, and my, <clears throat> excuse me, my mother cried. My dad asked me if he had done anything <laughs> Yeah. You know, as a father that he, you know, if, if he could have been a better father to me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, dad, this is who I am. It's not your fault. But they, I mean, I was, I was enrolled in law school in, in uh, Dallas at SMU Law School. And my dad was, he, he wanted me to stay in Dallas. He wanted me to go to law school. Okay. So he was actually quite, I think, quite upset that I just moved to L.A., and you know, two weeks before classes started, I was like, "Dad, I'm not going to law school. I'm moving to Hollywood." Whoa. And uh, he was like, uh, "Okay, whatever you want to do." Yeah, well, this is this is a father who's he's he's got a profession. He's well thought of. He's an attorney. And you think if my son's going to be in some profession, he's going to be a doctor or a dentist or an, or an attorney or something, maybe even an engineer, but not something artsy and creative and and in that Hollywood vein. How did he accept that when he first found out that you don't want to be those professionals, you want to be a Hollywood professional? He was, I think he was really disappointed. I mean, he didn't show it that much, but I think deep down he was very disappointed. September 2009, I mean, you still hadn't, the, you're still in the gay lifestyle. You get back to Hollywood, back to California. This is my life. I'm not sure I want to be part of that whole jet set thing anymore in the party life. And uh, there's got to be something else. I'm gay, so I can't go to God. But something happened there in September of, of 2009 that uh, is really unusual. I mean, it's just something that just come out of nowhere to you. Yeah, something really crazy happened in September 2009. So I was at my favorite coffee place with my best friend who was gay. Uh, big. He's a big movie producer. And... and uh, we, that was our usual weekend. We would go to brunch. We would go to, we would go shopping in Beverly Hills or West Hollywood. Then we would go to, you know, this coffee place in Silver Lake, which is kind of like the very, it's a very sort of like hipstery, young, progressive part of LA. Not all of LA is kind of like that now, but <laughs> <laughs> so we were having coffee, doing our usual thing, chatting and you know, probably talking about guys or something. And then we noticed this table sitting next to us and there was a group of young people and they had Bibles on the table. Whoa. Like there were like five, I think there were five Bibles on the table. I remember a lot of them. And that was a shocking sight to see yeah. in LA because I had never seen a Bible in public and neither had my friend. And so we looked at each other, we looked at the Bibles and we looked at each other and we were like, what is going on? And and we kind of had this moment and then he kind of urged me to to turn around and talk to them because he liked to stir up kind of kind trouble, of, yeah. basically. <laughs> and so I just eventually I turned to them and I said, you know, hey, are you guys like Christians? What's the deal? And they said, yeah, you know, we're evangelical Christians and we go to a church in Hollywood called Reality LA and and so we got in this long conversation with them and I literally, I literally asked them, what, what do you believe? What's the gospel? Mm -hmm. What, what, it, I don't even remember. I grew up Roman Catholic. I don't remember anything really like, tell me what your faith is. That's kind of a Christian's fantasy when an atheist, yeah. you know, asks them, like, tell me what, tell me about your, the gospel. <laughs> and so they explained the gospel. They explained, you know, their faith and uh, just kind of more about themselves and, and then, of course, I get to the, the $64,000 question, and I said, well, what does your church believe about homosexuality? Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we believe it's a sin. And, uh, and I wasn't shocked by that because I, I that. kind of assumed that it was going to – I assumed I assumed they believed that. But mm -hmm. what, what, what I was shocked at is that I didn't just storm off and say, you guys are crazy and you need therapy, like I'm leaving – and the reason I didn't do that is because of the six months before that, that night in Paris, I had that like mm -hmm. existential crisis 
So I was kind of open to hearing more about, I, I, at that point I was like, okay, maybe I'm wrong about everything. Maybe there is a God, maybe homosexuality is a sin. I don't even know. Like, what if I've built my entire life on this false foundation and don't even know it? So then they invited me to church the following Sunday. And I had, I was like, I honestly didn't know if I was going to go. I just was like, well, just give me the address and I'll think about it. And I, I had a whole week to kind of think it through. And it was a big deal because it's like, as a gay, in the gay community, it's like uh, such a betrayal to the community. Yeah, yeah, to what, go. what did your friend think, the one that was with you when they invited you to church? He, um, he kind of just hung back and was just listening to the whole conversation. And he didn't really say much. He, he's very quiet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I... I kind of did all the the work and mm -hmm. uh, all the talking and he wasn't he he didn't even it, it, it was understood that he wasn't going to go with me to right. church okay. if, we, if I if went. You went it was you're, just you're on your own if you went I was on my own yeah and so it was a big deal because it was just like if anyone found out that I went to an I, you know an evangelical church it, it would have been weird and embarrassing and kind of scandalous so I, I thought about it for the whole week, and then the following Sunday, I woke up and I, I was like, I guess I'm going to do this. I'm going to go to this church, and I had no idea. I had no concept of an evangelical church because I'd grown up in the Catholic Church, and um, I didn't know what I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what was going on there, and I so I drive to this high school auditorium in Hollywood where it meets. And I walked in and I heard the Christian worship music and I, that was my first kind of like, you know, I sort of cringed at that when I was like, oh my gosh, Christian music, I forgot that existed. And oh, wow, this is like, this is real. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm really here. Uh, and, uh, but then I liked the music. It was actually really good. And I, and then I sat down by myself and the pastor came out and preached a sermon for an hour on Romans chapter seven, part of chapter seven. Yeah. And I just, as he was preaching, stuff started happening. I mean, while, while he was preaching, everything he was saying, every word he said was resonating as truth in my mind, in my heart, and I didn't know why. And everything he said, I was just, I would affirm in my mind, oh my gosh, that's true. That's true. That's true. And he was preaching the gospel for like an hour basically. And it was the first time I, in my life, I had heard and fully understood the gospel. And I finally went over to this guy and I, and I said, I don't know what I believe, but I'm here. And so he prayed for me. It was, it seemed really powerful and very loving. And then I walked back to my seat and I sat down, everyone else was still standing and, and singing and worshiping for the next 25 minutes. I sat down and that's when the Holy Spirit just suddenly just completely fell upon me. Oh, wow. And I, God revealed himself to me in that moment. And it was, I remember, he just, in my mind, he said, I'm God. Jesus is my son. Heaven's real. Hell's real. The Bible is true. Welcome to my kingdom. And I just started bawling, bawling hysterically for like the next 25 minutes. And it was like the curtains had parted well, and I could finally see the truth for the first time in my life. It's a Paul, it's a Paul moment. I mean, the same thing, it was happened, a, it was the same thing happened to Paul. Total the Damascene moment. Like it was, it was so intense. And uh, I, I was weeping just, I was in the presence of the holiness of God. And it was like Isaiah in the temple when he sees God's holiness and comes undone. I just completely fell apart and, was sobbing and sobbing and sobbing and sobbing until the end of the service. And then I came home and I got in bed to take a nap because I was so freaked out. <laughs> and I was, while I, it just right when I got in bed and laid down, it happened again. God was like, let me show you some more of my glory. <laughs> and I just was like, whoa. And I jumped out of bed and again, just immediately started crying again. And I, in the middle of my bedroom, I was like, God, you have my whole life. I'm yours. I'm done. And I knew in that moment that homosexual behavior was a sin. I knew that it was no longer part of my future. 
but I didn't care because I had just met Jesus, the king of the universe. And I was like, good riddance to that old life. I'm going to go with this guy. He's amazing. And that was 11 years ago. I, I got to ask you the obvious question. Here's the new Beckett. I'm going to go with this guy. But do I go with this guy as a gay Christian? Do, am I instantly, miraculously, do I become homosexual? I mean, heterosexual? Uh, what happens to the new, the new Beckett? Because you've got this same-sex attraction. Uh, did any of that cross your mind about who am I now? I, my identity was, was as a gay man. Yeah, I mean... I was, I mean, I, as soon after that, I, as I read the entire Bible immediately, I was obsessed with it uh, and listened to hundreds of sermons. I didn't, my identity was in Christ, but I mean, I, I didn't suddenly become heterosexual. Right. But I have to say that um, my, my attraction to the same sex was diminished by like 90%. I mean, it was, God had so much grace on me. And so where the, the day before I got saved, my thought life was dominated by sexuality. I always thought about sexuality, sex, sex in, in that whole world. And But the day after, I, it barely crossed my mind. I didn't even think about it. And I still, it's, it's a very, it's something that I rarely think about, but I, I would never identify as a gay Christian. That That's not, that's, that's my old self. That's my old man. Yeah. And that's not, I would never use that adjective to de describe myself. I'm just a, I'm just a Christian. Yeah. I'm in Christ. And uh, yeah, I have struggles like everyone else has struggles and I have, you know, I've, there's temptations, whatever, but I'm more than happy to deny myself taking my cross and follow Christ. The story of Beckett Cook is one of the amazing stories we share each week on Viewpoint. This show is not about explaining God from a book but how experiencing your relationship with God can change a life. Beckett shares the rest of his story in just a moment. As the climate in our world grows more hostile toward our Christian worldview, Viewpoint is a program designed to help defend our faith. Each week, Bob Placey interviews guests who bring the Bible into focus. And we can be salt and light in this culture. Every description of Babylon in this book is going to come to pass. Helping us understand how relevant God's Word is for today. Viewpoint is completely viewer supported. If you've enjoyed and benefited from our interviews, we would ask you to consider helping us by supporting it financially. Your 20, 50, or even $100 monthly gift will help us continue to bring you more of these programs. Go to WTLW.com now and click Get Involved or you can send a check to the address on your screen. Thank you for supporting Viewpoint. Viewpoint with Bob Lacey is now available as a podcast. Download your favorite podcast app like iTunes, Google Play, or Spotify, and search for Viewpoint with Bob Lacey. Subscribe and listen as we discuss these important topics each week. You've got these friends. You've got a whole support group and throughout, throughout Hollywood, people that, that affirm you and people that, uh, that you enjoy being with. And, and how do you tell them? So I sat down each person like one day, you know, for the over course of like three weeks, I had a conversation one on one with all of my very, very close friends. And these are friends I'd had since, I mean, some of them since high school, I mean, who live out here. And it was very shocking to them. I mean, one of my friends came over. She was in town from New York and she stopped by and she's like, Beckett, like, tell me what's going on. Like, what's what's new in your life? And I was like, I have. And, then, and she was very close friends with me. I mean, we wrote a couple screenplays together and she's like, what happened? What's going on in your life? And I was like, I have the craziest thing to tell you. And she was like, what? Are you moving? Like, do you have, did you meet a new guy? And I'm like, well, I did meet a new guy, <laughs> new guy. but his name is Jesus. And I was like, I'm, I'm a born again Christian. And she just was like, what? Uh, and it was so shocking to people. This is your, your social life. This is a big part of who you are. Did you feel like you were socially adrift then that you had to find some kind of new, new social? No. I never had a moment of kind of like 
being adrift or feeling lonely or feeling like I didn't have any, you know, friends because I immediately had this whole new set of friends in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, yeah, the body of Christ has got to surround you to, I mean, to all of us, actually, to, to hold us accountable at the same time to be praying for us and, and to maintain the lifestyle that God has called us to. And, and we know that sin is sin, but in, in uh, the gay lifestyle, it becomes an identity. It's, it's different than, say, if mm-hmm. you're, you're, you, you were uh, an adulterer. You don't go around saying, I'm an adulterous Christian. Uh, so saying I'm a gay Christian, there, there's a difference in, in the fact that it, 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 you, it becomes your identity rather than a, an identity in Christ. That's why this sin in particular is so difficult to unravel because mm-hmm. it is so deeply, deeply tied. And I get it. I mean, I was there for many, many years. And I, I again, like thought Christians and evangelicals were the enemy because I was gay so I get it. I get it. It's hard to un- untie. And the only person who can unravel that identity is the Holy Spirit. The Holy so Spirit. that's what happened to me that day. Otherwise, there's no there's no way I could have left that life. Yeah. There's absolutely no way. And to ma- maintain what Christ has called you to, he's called you to a celibate life. But uh, yeah. you just mentioned something about churches, and uh, churches are looked on as the enemy. I mean, you, you hear it from the pulpit. You hear it from a lot of churches. It's, it's sin, it's sin, it's sin. And it sounds like what the church is against, we ought to be talking to people more about what we're for, that we're for loving people. How, how do you recommend a church would, uh, would respond to, or I don't want to say react to, but respond to, embrace a gay couple that's coming in every Sunday, they're holding hands uh, you, you, absolutely in a, in, a, in a lifestyle together. How should a church respond to that? There's a couple things. My church... Uh, is kind of big. So there's, th- I think, 3,000 members or people who go to my church. So people get kind of lost in the shuffle. Mm-hmm. So you don't really know who's coming in or coming out or going out. But um, there was this one couple who was coming every Sunday. It was a gay couple, young. They were 25, two guys. And they were, you know, would come to church, hold hands, you know, do the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And nobody really... You know, no one said, Lee, you have to leave the church or you can't be here. Like, what are you doing? They, they, I think the ethos at my church is more like, let them just hear the gospel. Let the Holy Spirit do the work and we're, just keep coming. And we're going to just we're just going to preach the word and let you hear the, the gospel every week. And then cut to the a year after the this couple was coming to my church. One of the guys got saved and was convicted by the spirit. And they ended up breaking up, and now the guy is an amazing Christian. Uh, but the other thing is, you know, Jesus in the Gospels, if you, if you really pay attention to how he interacted with people one-on-one and how he dealt with sin, he was the, he, of course, he was, he had the perfect balance of grace and truth. He was the master of it. And so he would... He would love people like the the woman at the well, the woman of Samaria. He like he can't, he loved her and he was so gentle with her, but he also was like, <laughs> you can't do this anymore. Like you know, and she. So it's like this balance of have your convictions settled on this issue, but also love people, and and don't be shy about about you know the truth because i I, I, because again when those young people told me that homosexual behavior was a sin according to their beliefs i appreciated how honest they were and how how forthright i i'm glad that they didn't try to dodge the question and sort of fake an answer so i think it's it's that balance of grace and truth and it's hard to do but you it's just we you know just pray that for the spirit to lead you in those moments uh Another question, you had mentioned that uh, as you were coming of age, that back then homosexuality was more of, an, of a, a behavior rather than an identity. Yeah. And uh, things have changed a lot since then. Uh, you, you've got, a, you've got a, a, a program going on now. I, I think it's on the Internet. Beckett Cook, right? The Beckett Cook the Show. Beckett Cook it's Show. On, and on de- YouTube. Yeah. Dealing with, with cultural indoctrination. Give me a little hint about what that show deals with. And and how we have changed and how the, almost imperceptibly the whole, the whole uh, environment has changed about how we look at s- such things as, as the gay lifestyle. Yeah, I mean, I, the reason I started the show, I started 
couple months ago and I do an episode per week and for now and maybe more later. But basically the reason I started the show is I, you know, after I became a Christian, of course, my entire worldview changed completely 180 degrees. Everything changed. And it was even it was hard. It was like almost impossible for me to read The New York Times anymore <laughs> or The New Yorker. Like I used to read these publications every day, all the time. And and now I saw them as just complete secular humanist sort of lot like that worldview was just so toxic to me because I bought into it for so many years. And so I believed all those lies. I was indoctrinated in all the lies of the secular humanist scientific naturalistic worldview. And so now on my on the Becca Cook show on YouTube, I I, I take a look at the lie, uh, whatever the lie is, um, I take a look at the lie and examine it and break it down and then and then and bring the biblical truth that's behind the lie and 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 kind of explain what that is, what the real the what what really is going on. So um, you know, I have episodes on on abortion. I just did an episode on abortion where I'm, I mean, I used to I used to be pro-choice, and of course, after I got saved. And I understood the Imago Dei that we're created, that human beings are created in the image of God. I instantly became pro-life. Like it was, it was like dramatic. Mm-hmm. And so I talk about that because it just was legalized in Argentina. So I used that as a jumping off point. But, um, but so there's a ton of lies uh, <laughs> in our culture that, uh, you know, be your, be, you know, follow your heart, be, mm-hmm. be, be you, you be you. Um, and so I go through that and, and, and for my show. So it's the, it's the Beckett Cook Show. We'll find it on, on YouTube? It's on YouTube, on yeah. On YouTube. Well, I do have to say, it's a, the book is A Change of Reflection, or it's a Change of, a change a change of, of affection, affection, of Affection, yeah. by Beckett yeah. Cook. And the foreword is by Francis Chan, one of my, one of my, one of my favorite uh, pastors. But I, I did mention, this, this, is, this is a book that I read that really challenged me on how strong my own commitment was, or is, uh, to uh, the lifestyle that Christ has called me to and, and, and to Jesus Christ. It is a powerful book. Beckett, thank you very much. We've got to get you back on and talk more about some of the things you're talking about in cultural indoctrination and some of the changes we see in our society. But thanks for the book. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Bob. I, yeah, thank you for having me on. One thing I learned over and over with these amazing stories on Viewpoint is never say someone is too far gone that God can't reach them. Keep praying for God's grace on loved ones who may be deceived by the things of this world. God is relentless in pursuing us. Thanks for watching and thank you for making this show possible. We couldn't do it without you. Remember, you can watch the interviews you've seen today on demand on YouTube. Plus, you can also listen to all of our episodes on the Viewpoint with Bob Placey podcast on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you listen to a podcast.